Well, hello everyone from wherever you are, from whatever time zone you are. Today, I'm, so I'm Igor, I'm going to share with you some really cool uh, algorithms when it comes to garbage collection. All right, so this is just a you know, disclaimer saying this is live just for information purposes. So the outline of what I'm going to be going through today, I'm going to start with the very basics, assuming everyone here knows what GC is, then I'll go dive right into the algorithms. And they're going to use OpenJ9 as an example because having that uh, real life example with this algorithm, I think, it makes, it, makes it a little bit easier to understand how they actually work. And I'm going to finish off with double mapping, which is a, uh, an advanced technology that we use in OpenJ9. And uh, it's really cool. So let's go right into it. So, before a little bit about me, I'm a software developer at IBM. I completed my master in Waterloo. I, I did mostly machine learning and AI there, nothing related to what I do here. And I'm um, interested in systems, compilers, and I'm a tennis addict. Okay, so the algorithms I'm gonna be talking to you about today, uh, uh, it's related to OpenG9, so you can get a, a binary from, or adopt OpenGDK if you wanna play it around with it. And uh, OpenG9 is a fairly mature project. It came to the open 2017. And a fun fact about it is that it, it actually started as an embedded JVM. I don't remember the, the name of the mobile um, phone number at the time, but it actually started as a mobile uh, JVM at the time, which is really cool. So garbage collection. So this is a, like by the book definition. So garbage collection is a form of automatic memory management. The garbage collector attempts to reclaim memory occupied by the object that are no longer being used by the application. And that's opposed to other programming languages like C, C++, like you. You, as a developer, have to manually allocate and deallocate memory. Some of the responsibilities of the GC include allocate memory, identify the liveness of data. So every, all that, all those objects, all that data that's not reachable is going to be considered dead. Therefore, it's going to be reclaimed by the garbage collector. Some advantages of a garbage collector. So it's an automatic memory management, right? It uh, unburdens the, the, the developer to manually allocate memory and deallocate. So it, it helps reduce certain ca categories of bugs like dangling pointers, double freaks. But on the other hand, we have the negatives. It requires additional resources like additional CPU, uh, CPU cycles, more memory, can cause unpredictable pauses. Those are known as the stop the roll pauses introduce runtime costs, they read and write theirs that I'm gonna talk to you about today. And application has little control of when and where is it claimed. Cool. That out of the way, now we have a, uh, an idea of what GC is. So these are some of the algorithms, uh, the known algorithms out there, right? And I'm gonna explain them um, through the view of OpenG9. So one that I'm not gonna explain through OpenG9 is reference counting. So just to get our feet wet. Um, let's talk about what reference counting is. So imagine we have this object graph. So we have a, an object pointing to object A, another one pointing to B, and both A and B are pointing to C. In reference counting, every object counts how many references it's pointing to itself. So here C has counts of two, A and B has counts of one. Then we, the reference from BGC is deleted, therefore we decrement the, the, count the counter of C, now it becomes one, and then we delete the reference from A to C, and then C, the counter becomes zero, and now C can be reclaimed. So reference count very simple, right? You can pretty much implement in any um, runtime, uh, any runtime you want, but there is a downside. What do you do, what do, you do with cyclic references, right? So imagine we have, a uh, double linked list, but that's link that this double linked list is not reachable from the object root. So what do you do? So in that case, reference counts normally implemented with some other garbage collector algorithm because ref reference count itself cannot deal with cyclic references. Okay, so I'm gonna go through three policies in, from OpenG9. The first one is a very simple one of throughput. It's a stop the world parallel collector. The second one is GenCon CS. Uh, CS stands for concurrent in scavenger, it's a pauseless collector. And lastly, I'll talk to you about balance, which is a region-based collector. So the first one of throughput is a very simple collector, 
parallel global collector, the GC operations are completely stop the road pauses. As I said before, stop the road are all those GC operations where the application threads are all halted or paused. It's a mark sweep and an option a compaction collector. I'm going to explain each of what each of these mean. And operation completed in parallel. I forgot the L there, but in parallel meaning we have multiple GC threads collecting the, the heap. We have an overhead of the mark map because we need the mark map to help the GC collect these objects. So normally when we start an application that has a GC underneath it, we normally allocate what we call the heap. And all the objects are going to be allocated in this heap. Normally, this heap is a contiguous region of memory. It doesn't have to be, but over 90% of the time, it's going to be a contiguous region of the memory. And here, furthermore, we divide this into two logical spaces, small object area and large object area. And most objects are go to this small object area. So this is how an application behaves under this policy. The white arrows represent the application thread and the red represent the GC thread. So whenever the application thread depletes the heap, we hit the limit of, and we cannot allocate any more objects, we trigger GC. So we have the stop the road GC there, then application can continue once the GC cycle is done, and the application can continue from there. So very simple. So the different phases of this GC, GC cycle include marking, where if it finds all the objects or the live objects through the object graph, we start from the roots. And then it, we sweep this, uh, this graph, reclaiming those dead objects, meaning all the objects that were not marked, we collect from uh, in the sweep phase. And there's a compaction optional phase because this heap can get fragmented over time. So what does it mean, a uh, fragmented heap? So imagine the application is running and then you have a bunch of garbage collections. And after a while, our applications are gonna become like a Swiss cheese with a lot of um, small free spaces that we wouldn't be able to allocate a contiguous object. Therefore, we, what we can do is take all these live objects, put into a, a certain portion of the heap and then we have all these free space that we can work with. So that's called compaction. And that's really expensive. So it, it, uh, it's recommended that we avoid compaction uh, the most. Now, next we have GenCon. And here I'm gonna explain the more sophisticated version of GenCon, which is concurrent scavenger. So this is a generational pop collector, meaning objects, it's gonna have ages now, meaning if an object survives a cycle, its age is incremented. So it provides significant reduction in stop the road post times. It, here we're gonna include the read and write barriers because we're gonna be marking and moving objects concurrently with the application. And we need these write barriers and you're gonna see why. And this is a positive GC because the objective of, of this GC is to um, remove GC pauses uh, by the most. If you're familiar with other JVMs, the hotspot, they, they have ZGC, and there's another one called Shenandoah, you guys probably heard about. Those, those are also puzzlers garbage collectors. So here, instead of dividing the heap into small and small object area and large object area, divide the heap into two spaces, new and old space. The old space is called tenure, and the new space is the allocate and survivor. All objects gets allocated into allocate space. And once that space is depleted, we the GC, which is the scavenger here, copies all the objects from allocate to survivor. So here um, we are not sweeping the, the, the objects. We actually, we actually have a copy collector that's gonna be copying the live objects from one location to another. Okay. So how does the application behave on their gen con? So application, again, the white arrows there. And then we have a concurrent scavenger. So we have two stop the road, very short stop the road pauses, one at the beginning, one at the end. So the one at the beginning is done, is there for us to mark the routes. And then once that's done, we can let the application threads run concurrently with the GC threads, which is the yellow arrows they're representing. And then once the GC cycle is done, we stop all the application threads again, just so 
we can bring the GC threads into synchronization so that we can let the, the application run from there. So there we have another concurrent scavenger. And here we have what we call global, uh, global marking phase. And so you notice here that uh, we are only collecting the new space of the heap. So you might ask, when, when, when are we going to connect the old space, right? Uh, that's where global marking phase comes in. So it concurrently marks the tenure every once in a while because uh, the idea of gen coins is that new objects die young, right? So um, global phase only running every once in a while, and that's run uh, on the, only on the tenure space. Now, right there. So let's imagine we have the phone operation, right? We are setting a field of an object, a reference. And imagine we have the following object graph. So we have the roots, where all the rest of the objects are reachable from. And roots points to A, points to B, and B points to C. So GC here is marking objects concurrently with the application. And GC has already visited the roots, which is the green thick mark that represents, has already visited A, is in the middle of visiting the, the B object, which is the yellow thick, and C and you know, GC hasn't been visited C yet. So I use the green, yellow, and red marks here, but in reality is the, the three color abstraction, right? The white, gray, and black. Here I use the uh, green, yellow, and red because I think it's easier to uh, visualize. Okay, so imagine we have this state of the object graph. And then, uh, application thread comes along the list, the, point, the pointer from B to C and adds and reference from A to C. And then and the, the GC thread is going to be, okay, B doesn't point to anything, then I'm done with B. And this is my resulting object graph, meaning I have marked the roots, I have marked object A and B, but I haven't marked C, so therefore I'm going to collect C. But as you can see from the, from the graph here, C is rich from for A, which is rich from the roots, which if we collect C, then something's going to go wrong for sure. And because of that, we need a right barrier. So how is this right barrier implemented? So we, whenever we set a field of uh, an object, we, we check is there a concurrency active. If there is, we dirty that object, meaning at the, at the end of the GC, we just go through this uh, uh, data structure that's going to have all these dirty objects to, so that we can scan them again, so that we don't lose these uh, concurrent uh, updates. Cool. Now we do actually need another right barrier because we might have references going from old space to new space. But scavenger, because the scavengers only collect the objects in the new space, so it might not know about these references going from the old to the new space. Therefore, we need another barrier here. And this is a very simple one. You just check if it's age tenured, meaning it's age in the old space, and C is not tenured, meaning C is not in the, is, it is in the new space. And um, if that's the case, we remember A as well. And since we have two barriers here, we can just uh, include them in the same barriers to uh, save some cycles here. And that's our resulting uh, right barrier. All right. Now let's, so this is the scenario where we are just marking objects, but what if we have, uh, what if the GC is actually moving objects concurrently with the application? So let's imagine the following. We have, I think this is on the way. So we imagine we have the two threads, one represent the GC thread, one represent the Motea thread. So the green one represents the GC thread and the orange G1, the Motelia thread. And both, so GC thread is trying to copy the object because it's collecting the heap. And Motelia thread is trying to modify a field of this object. So, okay, let's, so maybe we can deal with it with a CAS operation, a compare and swap, an atomic operation, right? So how would this be? So they are competing here to install a forwarding pointer in the in this object, and then whoever wins copies the object. So let's say the GC thread wins the race here. So GC installs the forming pointer and starts copying the object. And then we tell it, okay, I lost, no matter. 
are going to follow the foreign pointer and access the object. But the G thread might not be finished with the copying, and then mutated thread might access garbage, which is bad. So what we can do here is uh, this. We copy unconditionally the object. Both threads copy unconditionally the object, and then we they and only then they raise to install the foreign pointer, right? So how would this work? So both copy the object, and only then they raise to install the foreign pointer. So here, let's say you see thread one, the mutated thread is going to be okay. I lost. No matter. I'm going to follow the foreign pointer and access the object, and I'm going to throw my copy away. And here, since um, you see has already copied the object, we don't won't have any problems because we're going to have going to be access a full copied object. OK, now the last uh, policy here is a region-based collector, different from the other ones, but still the generational. Instead of the objects having ages, the region is going to have an age. So every object in the same region is going to have the same age. It provides some reduction, stop the world pause times. And uh, we do have a right area similar to the one in GenCon because we can have multiple regions pointing to a certain region. So we need a way to remember that. And if you have an incremented heap defragmentation here as well. So how does this work? So it's a region-based collector. We try to divide the heap into um, many regions, between 1,000 to 1,000 regions here. So the bigger the heap, the bigger the regions. You could, there's a, other options here. You, may, you might have another way to do this. You could uh, say every object from the same region is going to have the same size. There are ups and uh, advantages and disadvantages to that, right? But here, every object in the same region is going to have the same age. And the, big, the bigger uh, the heap, the bigger the region. If an object is bigger than a region, we throw it out of memory with the exceptions of arrays, which we use arraylets. What we do is divide the array into chunks and we put a chunk here, a chunk here, and have the header pointed to the different chunks in the heap. So how does balance work? So application starts PG systems for partial garbage collector, which is a copy collector very similar to the scavenger, which is going to copy all the objects from one region to the next. And we have some PGCs. And what GMP stands for is a global marking phase, because PGC only has local information about, about the regions, because it's trying to collect those, those regions with the highest return of investment, meaning those regions that has the highest number of that objects. But with time, it loses this information. So GMP is there to help update the PGC information. Okay, now, another right barrier here. This is a different right barrier. So whenever we implement a right barrier, it's always, always a trade-off, right? So should we put the burden of the barrier on the mutator thread, or which is another word for the application thread, or should we put the burden on the GC thread, right? So here we decided to put the burden on the GC thread. So this is a very similar barrier from the GenCon, uh, where we have objects pointing from old to new space. So this is how the barrier looks like. So we have an unconditional dirtying of the object there. So you see in the top there, whenever we set a field of the object, we dirty the card unconditionally. And then we just, OK, I don't care, just dirty it, because PGC is going to take care of it. So at the beginning of the um, GC cycle, we go through these dirty cards and check if there's an inter-region reference, right? If there is, then we add that to our remember set card list, and then we deal with that. The GC deals with that. OK. Now I'm just going to talk through real, really quick about ArrayLets. So uh, ArrayLets are these technologies that we use to allocate uh, large arrays into different regions, right? So we imagine we have a very large array that could span multiple regions in a region by GC. So instead of allocating that array in a contiguous block of memory, what we do is we divide that array into chunks. We put a chunk here, a chunk here, a chunk there, and we have the header pointed to these different chunks. So we, if you want to reference, say, the first element of this array, right? we could just go through the first arrayoid, which is another word for reference. 
we follow that pointer and we go going to go through the last uh, blue uh, block there and access the first element. However, there are some APIs that require contiguous representation of this array, which is not good, uh, which is not good because uh, right now we have this discontinuous representation of the array, right? So what, what did you, we use to do in this scenario to have a discontinuous representation? Simple, we, call, we create a temporary array, right? Copy element by element to this temporary array. Then we pass this temporary array to the API. The API does whatever it has to do with this array. Then we copy everything back. And yes, that's really expensive, right? So what can we do to mitigate this? That's where double mapping comes in. So we can make this contiguous array let's look like contiguous. So we take advantage of 64-bit systems, which has a large virtual space. So what we do is we take two virtual memory addresses and map to the same physical memory address. And the beauty of it is that any modification to one virtual memory address is uh, reflected in the other virtual address and vice versa. So this is more or less how it looks, the multi-mapping, right? So we map that to the second virtual address in such a way that it's gonna look contiguous and we just pass that reference to the whatever API that requires the contiguous representation of the array, and voila, any modification to that second virtual address mm -hmm. is going to be reflected to the original one. And that can be extended to other, other things. You can have three, four virtual addresses uh, mapped to the same physical one. And that's the case of ZGC, which is a policy that uses that for the entire, uh, for the entire heap. Okay, so I'm almost done. I have a few minutes left. Uh, so things to consider when designing a new GC policy, right? So you saw here we have different heap layouts, right? Like maybe it's a new old space, region-based. Some of them use concurrency, some of them doesn't. But when we do use concurrency, um, my, maybe you're marking objects concurrently, maybe we are moving objects concurrent, concurrently. In, in order to have a concurrent, um, consistent view of the heap, we need read and write barriers. And there's always, always gonna be an overhead of those, right? Because we need to check every time we make, um, every time we read or write to our object reference, we have to check those if a concurrent, uh, concurrent cycle is in progress, right? To make sure we don't fall into those scenarios where we're gonna lose a reachable object. Also, another question we can ask, how often do we collect objects, right? Should we deplete the heap before we collect objects? No, that's not a really great idea, right? So that all these questions that need to take into consideration before we design a new good GC policy. So I included this slide here because there are a lot of really cool research regarding machine learning based GC. Um, I, at least to this day, I know, don't know any industry um, you see that's using machine learning, but there's a lot of research that's have been happening. For instance, um, there are a lot of questions here whenever we do machine learning with GC, right? What should we use a supervised model or in a reinforcement learning model, right? So there are some papers here that I pointed to that the first one here use a reinforcement learning model, right? And the other ones use the random forests and uh, some auto configurations, uh, so profiling data to feed this machine learning model. So another, so things like to consider like the, the features of this machine learning model should be like program, program counter, GC post times, heap fragmentation, liveness and dead objects ratio, right? Like there are a lot of questions like what should we consider in order to develop this machine learning model uh, based GC? So I think it's a really cool uh, um, topic uh, that hopefully one day we're gonna have we're gonna see an industry based uh, machine learning based uh, EC. So this is a really quick uh, um, table showing that uh, the GenCon is really good for web servers, desktop application balance, which is the uh, region based DC, is very good for large heaps. Optroput, which is really simple, uh, it's really good for a small heap because it has the highest long pulses. So in summary. 
whenever you design a GC or even with the current GC algorithms, there's no perfect GC out there. There's always going to be some algorithm that's going to be good for this uh, benchmark or for this workload, another GC that's going to, another GC algorithm that's going to be better for this workload. So one thing to keep in mind is that the higher, um, if you want a perfect stop the world GC, you don't care about the pauses, go with the perfect stop the world, right? Because you're going to have the higher throughput because it doesn't have to worry about read and write barriers. And um, on the other hand, we have the perfect pause on the GC, right? Where it won't have as many pauses, but it's going to have lower throughput because of the read and write barriers, because that's an overhead to keep the consistent view of the heap. And here we saw different ways that the GC can deal with the fragmentation, right? Maybe it's the, the this GC layout or how we collect the heap. So there's a lot of uh, things to consider here when designing uh, a really good uh, GC. So that's all I have. There are some links here for Eclipse of Genome Project, Adopt on, G Adopt on JDK there, Omar. And uh, since I'm out of time, and that's a good timing because I'm done, and I'll take questions. And before that, this is a book, if you're really interested about GC. This is the GC Bible. <laughs> Everything you need to know about GC, you can find it there. And uh, yeah, that's all I have.